Thank you, and uh, thank all of you for coming out um, in this it's only trying time, but uh, nonetheless, I predict we'll make it through it. <laughs> um, uh, I was uh, thrilled when my friend Jeff Trimbaugh asked me to come talk up here um, and started thinking about what I wanted to talk about. I want to start with the question of prudence. Uh, and it's really nice to be able to speak at for Veritas Academy. The word academy, of course, is, comes from uh, Academos, which was a Athenian hero, and there were a grove of olive trees outside of Athens named for him. Um, and that's where Plato taught in his, his students. Uh, so that's where we the name for this traditional place of learning, academy, the groves of academy. Uh, and Veritas, of course, is truth. So um, studying truth, I like that. Um, but I'm a teacher. I've, I've, I've warned, I, I tend to, this is about the size of a large class. So um, I'm going to walk around a little bit and, and talk to you. Uh, but I want to start with a story because uh, I think the best way to teach is through telling stories. And my story is about a young man named Levi Preston. Uh, this is a story I found in, when I was writing my book, I came across this and I always thought it's uh, a wonderful story. Uh, Levi Preston was a young man uh, and he fought the Battle of Concord. He was interviewed after the War of the Revolution uh, by a historian to ask why he fought in the battle. Uh, now, the Battle of Concord, remember, uh, is, comes after Lexington in 1775. Uh, British troops are sent from Boston out to Concord, where the rebels are supposedly hiding ammunitions. They pass through Lexington, uh, but they have had a warning from a fellow named, among others, Paul Revere, who's been sent by horseback to warn the countryside. The British uh, move on to Concord, and there is a uh, brief but somewhat intense battle at a bridge in Concord. Uh, and Levi Preston was a young man defending the bridge in Concord. Uh, and he's interviewed later, and the historian asks him, Why did he fight the battle? And the historian asks him first uh, whether he opposed the Stamp Act. This is the act you might remember that all of the taxes you had paid to the British had to have a stamp to show that you had paid them. And Levi Preston said, uh, no, it didn't bother that much. Well, said the historian, you must have objected to the tea tax. I mean, they, they were taxing your tea. And Preston said, no, uh, I didn't drink tea myself. And then the historian says, well, you, you must have read all those, those books about Republican theory and, and John Locke and Algernon Sidney and all these wonderful things. And, and Levi Preston said, no, I didn't read any of those books. I read the, the Almanac, I read the Bible. Um, that's about it. And so the story at this point is increasingly, you, you can't, you know, we always transfer, you can imagine he's getting increasingly agitated. Why aren't you answering my questions? And at a certain point, you can imagine the Preston kind of playing with him a little bit. And so the story finds, well, tell me, the, the British Army is the most powerful military force in the world. And you can imagine uh, at, at the Battle of Concord, if you've ever been there, it's a relatively, really a small place. But you can imagine in 1775, they would have heard horses coming because the mounted cavalry was at the front of the British regiments. And then they would have seen the dust in the distance. And they already knew that shots had been fired. And I'm sure there were you know, overly stated or, you know, uh, things that would happen. Why did he go by the fight, fight the battle of Concord? And so Preston, at the very turns to this historian, says, well, it was very simple. We had always governed ourselves. We intended to govern ourselves. And those regulars didn't think that we should. <laughs> End of interview. 
this charming vignette, if you will. But what's so great about it is when you start telling that story, everyone in my audience inevitably starts nodding their heads. Even the, even the people who are young and supposedly don't know history. They've heard of the various references I made. Concord, Lexington, Paul Revere. They make the same mistake that historians mistake. What's great about that story is, first of all, it kind of encapsulates a very simple understanding of what the revolution was about. It was about self-government. It was not an abstraction. But the particular story tells us something much more about um, how we think about those things. And the mistake that the historian made is he was making assumptions. He was feeding the interview. You see, and, and we shake our heads. Lexington like Concord, yes, I know that. Paul Revere, I've heard that. You see, the assumption we are making is that the Battle of Concord Right, the famous shot heard around the world. We are assuming it was the opening shot of the American Revolution. And as it turns out, it was. But the crucial thing is that Levi Preston didn't know that. Right? We and the historian have something called hindsight. We look backwards and we see a narrative. That's why it's so hard to teach history and to teach it well. The hardest thing about history is recapturing the moment, the contingencies, the possibilities. What did they know? What didn't they know? You see, for Levi Preston to show up that day and fight at that battle, first of all, he didn't know it was going to be battle. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know it was the beginning of the revolution. He didn't, it's a year before the Declaration of Independence was even written. But he made a choice to show up there. And the question for us is not how did it fit into our assumption about history. It's more of a question about why did he choose to do that? That's what he was talking about. The question is how do, you, how do you teach people to make good choices? And what is about choosing? I like to ask my students, I like to flummox my students. Um, and I ask them, for instance, what is courage? And inevitably, they will give me general comments. Or they might do the thing where they say, well, I can tell you what it is. It's not being rash. It's not being foolhardy. But I do it every semester, and it works every time. They can't tell me what courage is. They can give me a general, generic, broad definition. Well, it's doing the right thing in hard circumstances. Well, what is it? Well, no, what is it? You see, a virtue um, is, in its way, an abstraction. And we know it's not one of the extremes, right? But how to know what it is depends on the particular circumstance. Right? If I'm driving down my street and, and my house is on fire when I'm going home, courage is no longer an abstraction. But it's also now a particular thing. And the particular circumstances determine what the virtue is. It's only a virtue when it's actualized. Because until that moment, until I know that the right thing to do is to go into the fire to save my family, or my family is safe across the street, and so I don't go in because the house is about to collapse. Only then do we know what the virtue is. 
Until then, it's merely a description. And it would be nice if there was some sort of way to figure that out. That's prudence. Uh, the, the, uh, this, this old notion, uh, prodesis, the Greek word, uh, Aristotle talks about it at great length. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the sense of being able to make a decision under the circumstances, often is associated with temperance. For those of you uh, who, are, who are my age, think of, uh, you remember Dana Carvey? Right, he had this great impersonation of George Bush. Wouldn't be prudent. <laughs> right, it's, it's got this soft sense about it. But it's actually not that at all. It's an extremely dynamic thing. Um, and it helps us make decisions in particular circumstances. Indeed, it's one of the cardinal virtues. And of those virtues, I would suggest it is actually the most important as a virtue meaning a virtue having to do with our actions. And it's the most important virtue, not merely for virtue. You can't have any virtue without being prudent. Um, it's also the most important word, virtue of the whole Western notion of, uh, of virtue itself, of all of Christendom. It's the central, it is the central virtue. Uh, and it's probably the most important thing, I think, to teach our students. Let me unpack it for, for a, a few minutes. Um, the, the, the key to, to prudence, this idea of prudence is, uh, is deliberation. One of the difficulties in the, uh, that we have in teaching about virtue is the shorthand way of describing virtue usually is what? Habit. What's a habit? Hmm. Students will say, oh, something you do over and over again. Okay. So it's like muscle memory. Yeah, it's like second nature. To which the answer is, it's not. Something is a virtue, not because you do it over and over again through repetition such that it's no longer a rational activity. Virtue is always associated with a decision, a choice to do something or not to do something. It's never merely something you do because you've done it so many times you don't think about it anymore. Right? I walk into the bathroom, even though we've lived in our house now for five years, like more than that. I walk into the bathroom and I, a lot of times, my arm goes to the left and the light's on. And it hasn't been like that for 20 years because that was an older house, right? That's a muscle memory. But that's not a habit in the sense of being a virtue. Virtue is something you think about. You deliberate about it. You, you think it through. It's, it's, it's a way of knowing something. There are two elements of it that Aristotle talks about. Um, he has a whole book, and he's, he's a great book called The Ethics, where he talks about uh, this particular virtue called prudence. And part of it is, is uh, to deliberate as a way of coming to know something and also a way of deliberating towards action. And we start to see that there's two aspects of this and it starts to tell us why prudence is the central virtue. Right? The deliberation towards knowing something, knowing about core truths, about veritas, about um, uh, first principles, um, of understanding, uh, of, of he talks about memory, which he doesn't mean merely what happened yesterday, it means uh, memoria, a true notion of history uh, in the past. Um, docility. Right? I was telling my students, I want docile students. Nowadays, I seem, that suggests them how they just sit there and absorb things. Oh, we don't want to be docile. Docile means openness to learning. Um, but then the other aspect of deliberation uh, is, is, is moving towards, towards action. You need experience. Uh, you need to have uh, a sense of providence. Uh, the, the providence meaning the ability that what you do now will lead to an outcome. How, how often when you're uh, dealing with children, my own kids, by, by example, is they, they think of doing something, 
but you just know it will never lead to that outcome. Right? That's a good idea, but you think that'll actually work? There's a sense in which you've got to have a sense of the relationship between doing something and a possible outcome. Um, and being able to have a right sense of comprehending things and proper caution and uh, command in the sense that you bring all this to bear on action and decision. This, he, he lays out a whole process by which you essentially create a, a mechanism to connect the principles of the thing, the, the thing we understand to be true, that's permanent, it's unchanging, with the particular circumstances. <coughs> it's a mechanism by which you actually can do something called virtue. Right? Because virtue, the idea of something, is an abstraction. The challenge is to bring that abstraction, that truth, to bear on particular circumstances. And that's what makes it makes it into a virtue. Um, so doing the right thing, the right time, for the right reason. Um, but making the right choices in thinking and acting, both sides of that equation. Um, let me give you a, pra a practical example. Um, a great way to teach, teach the virtue of prudence is to, is to read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, especially that famous second paragraph. We all know parts that we can quote by heart. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. That's a statement of principle. It's a statement of something that is said to be self evident, i.e., true. It's also an abstraction. Well, what does that mean? How does it work? It's in the middle of that paragraph we often forget. There's a transitional sentence, right? Begins by saying, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are great equal. They are endowed by the creator of certain unlimited rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, that to secure these rights, governments are considered among men, right? And consent, right, where it kind of, it kind of has this, this general abstract notion of what, what we hold to be true and what it means in some general sense. And in the middle of that part, it says, prudence, will dictate that we will not act, here I'm paraphrasing, for light or transient reasons. A long train of abuses amount to despotism. That is to say, it translates from the claim of truth to the particulars, and it, and it, it arranges the, the, the relationship between those two things. Um, how do you teach this? Aristotle writes this wonderful book called The Ethics. There's another wonderful book called The Politics. What's wonderful about them is the end of the politics says you have to read the ethics. You know, the ethics says you have to read the politics. He knows how to sell his books. Right? <laughs> uh, but there's also a connection between them. To be, to be political in the true sense means you must be ethical. To be ethical in the true sense means you need to be political. Not in the partisan sense, but in the sense that we are political beings. But for this whole book about the ethics, there's another way I'd, I'd like to influence my students. Right? The, the ethics maps out all these virtues. There are, there are virtues to control our passions, temperance, moderation. Uh, uh, there are uh, intellectual virtues, wisdom. Prudence is, is kind of the in-between virtue. Um, and almost in all cases, it's, it's what? He describes, you have too much of this, or you have too little, that's not the virtue but he never tells what the virtue actually is. Because he can't, by definition. Right? All you can do is learn how to understand the virtues so that when you come to your particular circumstances, you might act virtuously. And he says at the end of the ethics, in the discussion about prudence, I can't tell you who is prudent. I can't tell you what prudent is. All I can tell you is that you should go study those who have a reputation for being prudent. Um, so the two ways I think we need to answer this question about how to teach it is actually somewhat straightforward. 
One is you teach people something about the permanent things, about philosophy, about theology, about logic. You teach them the things that don't change, um, the ideas, um, the real things. But then you also teach them, and these things have to go together, you teach them about history. And more particularly, you teach them through biography. That is, you study people and lives of those who actually practice or perhaps fail to practice the virtues. Because as Aristotle tells us, you can't learn them merely through books, but you can through history because that really is a way of studying how they led and lived their lives. My, my community, a, 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 a great example of who I, uh, who I would have in mind is one of my moms. Some of you know I've written several books on George Washington. A great example. <coughs> I was saying earlier that I uh, originally wrote my PhD on Washington because being a typical graduate student, I thought it would be easier. He can't be that complicated, he's writing a book. Turns out he wrote more than any of the other founders, and he's actually extremely complicated because every moment of his life is constantly about what? Making decisions, making decisions under immense pressure, <coughs> making decisions in particular circumstances in which he had limited amounts of knowledge, right? No hindsight. It's a perfect example of a situation in which you would learn to be prudent. Indeed, he writes several letters where he talks about much was to be done, much by firmness, much by prudence. Washington loses more battles than he wins. He's not a successful general. That wasn't his objective. He's, he's, he's an embodiment of the principles of the revolution. He understands it. He knows them. He talks to Jefferson Madison. He understands the principle of that. He understands his job is to bring it into being, which means you make decisions, hard decisions oftentimes, that are compromises, but for the purpose of achieving that principle. The very definition, almost, of, of, uh, of, of being prudent. Uh, Jefferson later writes a letter, um, which say after the time that Jefferson was a great critic of Washington, right? They split. He formed his own political party because he liked the Federalists. He has criticized Washington in public, but now it's twenty years later. He's more into retirement. Washington's died. He's dead. Uh, and he's asked to write an assessment of Washington. And Jefferson writes a letter, perfect, perfect example of Jefferson and Washington. And his letter says, I know George Washington well, and I can tell you, he was no Bacon Newton or Locke. Which on the one hand is kind of a backhanded Jeffersonian comment. But of course it makes the point. He wasn't an abstract thinker. Jefferson goes on. Um, he was um, thought things through, once decided he never wavered, nothing ever, uh, nothing, no sense of interest or consanguinity um, uh, undermined his decisions. He was firm, he was just, and the most important aspect of his character was his prudence. Once understanding the principle of thing, seeing it through no matter what. Lincoln would be another great example of prudence. So when I teach these questions, I spend almost all of my time right, teaching case studies, teaching failed case studies too. Right. You study Lincoln, great model. You study Stephen Douglas, you study Washington, you study Benedict Arnold. Um, you see those things coming together. This recipe then of, of, of understanding the ideas, the abstractions, and understanding the practice 
uh, in terms of uh, especially studying biography, uh, understanding logic and rhetoric, right? Um, those are the, that's what classical education is. The answer to how do you teach people to be virtuous, <coughs> how do you teach prudence, is classical education. Right? It's, 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 it's a combination of understanding the truth of things, studying the, the, the long, deep, philosophically established truths, but then studying history um, and the way these things are actually done. Uh, it's a question you can. Um, it's a way of thinking. It's not a, it's not a technical thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's not perfect. It's, it's making prudential decisions. It's making compromises. But it's always pointed towards that higher end, the North Star, um, the, 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 the principal thing. Um, uh, you think of uh, William Wilberforce, uh, the great British uh, politician, uh, member of parliament. He spent 45 years until he uh, achieves his goal, which is abandoning the slave trade. 45 years. And it happened right before he died. Um, these things are never sometimes very, very long term. Uh, they are sometimes. Uh, on the other hand, very bold. Washington was extremely bold in the revolution. Think of someone like a Churchill, great world leaders. Um, it's not necessarily temperate or modest, um, but it is still prudence. Um, let me end with um, uh, another aspect of prudence, which is also important not to forget. Um, Aristotle makes clear in his classic definition, discussion of prudence, that the center of prudence that allows us to distinguish a prudent man from an imprudent man is something about their personal character. All the things I've, just, I've described, uh, good deliberation, uh, thinking things through, being properly cautious, being bold if necessary, making hard decisions in immediate circumstances, really turn on the character of the person making the decision. For example, as I described Washington as a great example of prudence, um, uh, think of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a lot, a lot about prudence. Um, Macbeth. Right? Macbeth was about to be the king of Scotland. He would have been a great, great man, but he goes the other way, right? We know he listens to the witches who tell him to be kings, so he likes to bring it about himself, so he kills, then he kills, and he kills, right? It, it really has to do with the, the, uh, the person themselves. Uh, the Declaration has, of Independence has a great phrase in it, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, I get a lot of questions when I speak to to groups on topics like that. Why that phrase, pursuit of happiness? <clears throat> it really is an odd turn of phrase. It's a wonderful, it's very, uh, um, sounds better, better to the ear, but it's not clear why they said that. You don't have a right to happiness, you have a right to the pursuit of happiness. Yet at the same time, the word happiness is the classical definition of what is the good. It's to be happy. It's happiness in that higher sense of, of the use of the word. And I think they knew they were using that word. Uh, there's an old medieval phrase called status viatoris, uh, which is to say that the human being is the only animal uh, that is um, in the state of being on their way, which is technically what the word means. State, status viatoris, of being on your way. Uh, say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recognition we're pilgrims, we're developing in our lives, we are growing, we are coming to know things that we might not have known before, we are moving towards something, uh, which for a Christian is, is to be in the presence of God, to have a beatific vision, um, to, to know the true, the good, the beautiful. Um, prudence is the virtue that allows us 
in this life to approach that. It's our guide um, along the way. Um, which is why, in the end, not only do I think this is the, the most important virtue, um, but it really is the virtue for us as mere humans to, um, to approach and lead our lives as we can here, uh, looking towards the light uh, hereafter. Um, which is why I think it is the most important thing to teach. And in your case, it's the hardest thing to teach but really at the center of what education should be about. I'll stop there.